Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Sonia Shevsky. I'm with the Com City Communications. Um, I want to thank you guys for taking time out of your day to attend uh, today's informational meeting. Um, up front here, we have um, some handouts and our, uh, is it October? October magazine uh, that pretty much lays out everything that Mayor Almond is going to be presenting today. Um, if you want to share anything with neighbors or on social media, we have a fully dedicated page with every single piece of information that you could possibly want, including a copy of our past presentations and recordings of past presentations. And um, by tomorrow, we'll also have today's up there as well. Um, that's shareable at tuckerga.gov slash public works. And um, so we invite you to check that out. A couple of housekeeping rules. <clears throat> we learned from our last presentation that comments from the crowd cannot be heard for our people on live stream. So uh, we will be asking that if you have any comments or questions, and there will be time for that as well at the end, to come up to this podium here and speak directly into the microphone. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, we do have comment cards up here and pens. If you have a question, write it down, hold it up. I'll snag it from you and I'll read it for you. Um, so, and also just so everybody knows if you need to use the restroom, go out here, turn right, turn right, and they're on your right. It's almost the full circle. Um, so at this moment, I'd like to thank um, all of our electeds for coming in today and showing um, their support for their community. We have from District 1, um, Roger Orlando and Virginia Reese. And from District 2, we have Kara Schroeder. And we also have Mayor Oman. Uh, from staff, we actually have quite a bit of staff here today and I'm grateful for that too. Uh, we have Ken Hildebrandt, our civil, our civil engineer, city engineer. Um, David Zay, our GIS expert. Courtney Smith, our Community Development Director. Uh, Jack Smith, no relation, um, also a city engineer. And Salim Malouf is our land development professional. And then of course we have Tammy Hanlon and John McHenry who are our city administration. I think someone's hiding. It's Corey. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for coming out and Mayor Almond. Good morning, everyone, and I'll add my thanks also for uh, being out here this morning. This is the second of three of these sort of big public meetings that we're going to have where you can uh, not only get all the information, but ask a lot of questions and things. As you can see, we have not yet achieved 100% attendance of the 38,000 residents of Tucker. And so we're going to be counting on you guys to sort of be ambassadors once you've learned all this and have all the information. We hope that you'll help share it with your neighbors uh, through all your various circles of contacts and so on. Uh, Sonia mentioned we're going to go through a, a slide deck and uh, I'll add some commentary, but that slide deck will be online. Um, we've been updating it every time we have a meeting, every time we one of us has been out to talk to somebody. Uh, we're going to the local service clubs and the Tucker Business Association and the Civic Association and like that, uh, in addition to these meetings. But every bit of feedback we get goes into these presentations and then they're updated online with the Q&A so that it's as current as it can be. And Sonia also mentioned over here on the table, there's some individual uh, pages of flyers that'll also contain hopefully everything that I talked to you about today. But I'll add a little commentary as we go along and then we'll save plenty of time for any questions or comments that you guys have at the end. So I think uh, we'll just start there and kind of work our way through. So. Mm -hmm. Let's begin with uh, what we're talking about with public works, because different cities use this term in different ways. In our case, uh, it, it refers to two different services, and let me even step one step back from that. Most of you probably understand and have heard somewhere along the way that when we began the city, we, it's a limited services city, and we began with three services, uh, being parks and recreation, zoning and planning, and code enforcement. The city does a whole lot more than that, but those are listed in the state constitution as services that the city can provide. And so uh, we began with those, and 
So when we talk about public works, there's really two separate services that we think of as one because they kind of go together and we'll see some of why that is. So when we say public works, um, we talk about uh, two separate things put together. Roads and maintenance is one and stormwater services, stormwater management is the other. And so that's all we're trying to show here. Sonia, if you want to keep going. Um, so roads and maintenance, so there, here's a short list of the kinds of things that are included there. This is different from what we do in paving roads or even occasionally creating a new road. This has, to, those are capital projects. That's the difference between that set of services that we're using SPLOST money to do and roads and maintenance services, which are all these things you see here. Um, part of the, the rationale, part of the reason this, adding these services uh, to what we do directly as a city is that right now, while we can pave a road or build a new sidewalk, we can't go fix it without double taxing you. So we pave it, spend big capital on it, but if it gets a pothole or a crack in the sidewalk, we have to call the county and say, please come fix the pothole or the crack in the sidewalk. Uh, stormwater services is the other half of that. Basically stormwater, just think of it as this is not drinking water, it's not sewer water. This is the water that falls from the sky, hits your roof, hits your driveway, hits a road. It runs off, it's gotta go someplace. That's stormwater. And so all the infrastructure, like the, the pipes and the ditches and the catch basins that handle that fall under stormwater services. And that's what we're talking about in this um, initiative. This is, um, I, I'm not gonna dwell on this cause it's a little shocking. And our point is not to disparage DeKalb County but since we became a city, we have met, so we have an intergovernmental agreement with DeKalb County to, to provide these two services that we're calling public works. Uh, we've met with them. Every time you call your representative or me or our staff and say, there's a pothole out here, the road's broken up, whatever it might be, it needs to be fixed. We report that to DeKalb and our staff, our city manager and her team meet with their counterparts in the county once a month and go over this in detail. It's an ongoing running list. This is reflective of that six years or so of service and how long these various issues have taken on average to be addressed. Uh, it's something that we think we can do a lot better on. That's part of the reason that we're going through this process. Um, so currently you saw that list of how long things are taken. It means that we have a long list of all of these categories of things that are with the county right now that we're at some stage of waiting for a response on. It's, it creates a backlog. So our goals, you see here, and we're gonna talk about them some more as we go along. If the referendum were to pass, it would, we would be in this business July 1 of next year. That's the beginning of our fiscal year. The first order of business is to take care of that backlog. Uh, and we're gonna talk about why this is a great time to be able to do that. But the idea would be get rid of that backlog, get rid of other things that are occurring in the meantime, increase responsiveness to current requests and reach a point where we're maintaining instead of repairing and dealing with old neglected items that have been around for a long time. Uh, that, that we think would be about a two year process, but we can, we have some money right now, which is a, a part of the reason that this is timely. And we believe we can be much more responsive and accountable on a very local basis. So, Really important thing to know, how many of you have voted already? Who voted yesterday? Way to go. Uh, this question, this item, is the very last thing on the ballot. So if you think you're gonna go and vote for one or two or half a dozen races that you really care about, that's up to you. Please go to the end of the ballot, <laughs> find this question. Uh, I'm not gonna read it to you. It's in all the materials that you have and so forth, but we tried to be as clear and as direct as we could. You know, these questions are often kind of convoluted. I'm going to unpack that a little bit uh, as we go along. Uh, this is just a reminder, voting started yesterday. You can vote absentee. You can vote early advance voting. You can vote on election day, just like every other uh, race that you might vote in. It'll be on your ballot, whichever one of these ways you choose to vote, and it'll be the last thing on the ballot. So think of me. Frank said, go to the last item on the ballot. What is a mill as referenced in the referendum? Who wants to stand up and define a mill for me? No, no. 
So <laughs> this is hey, Steve. This is the way we def we uh, we the city, the county, whoever uh, does property taxes. And so you see there a mill is the rate at which property taxes are assessed. A m one mill is one dollar per thousand of taxable value. And we're going to go over this just a little bit. Uh, it'll be helpful to your uh, civic understanding anyway. Um, and we'll talk about how the millage works here and what comes back from DeCab and so on. But just understand for the moment, one mill is $1 per taxable value of your property. All right, let's keep moving. So what happens if the public works referendum passes? Well, uh, I mentioned this a minute ago, in the, in the first year, the emphasis will be on uh, reducing this backlog of, and they're small and large, minor annoyances to significant um, repairs that are needed on things. That's the, the, we'll have to do both at the same time and we'll talk about that, but our biggest objective in that first year is to clear that backlog and get those projects done. Uh, by year two, we expect to be uh, providing significantly better response time relative to those numbers that I showed you a few minutes ago. Um, so here's a timeline. The, the referendum uh, is actually going on now, but you see their election day is November 8th, and we'll know the result. Should we pass with a yes vote on this referendum? Uh, immediately, it, it, uh, we begin getting in place the things, and we're actually underway with uh, making some preliminary plans. Uh, but by December, we have to um, submit the millage rate, which we're going to talk about some more, to the tax commissioner. So the cab is taxing you for this right now, and there has to be a time where those taxes begin to come to the city of Tucker instead of to the county of the cab. Uh, so January to June, uh, procurement process, setting up the infrastructure, the human infrastructure that's needed to uh, provide the service. And then July 1 of next year, we would be in this business and we would stop telling you, oh, we'll help you get the cab to fix that pothole. We will instead tell you, here comes Ken, he's gonna bring the truck. <laughs> um, so of course, everybody wants to know, okay, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Government, how much is this gonna cost me? And is it, is it gonna be worth it? Am I gonna get value for uh, what it's gonna cost in taxes? This is to say to you, so there's, there's two parts of the cost to all of this. It's true now, it would be true under the city of Tucker as well. Um, so we did some examples to give you an idea, and we can't tell you exactly in your case, which we'll show you why in just a second. The average home value in the city of Tucker is $328,000. With the millage rate that we expect to, to implement when we're providing the service, that amounts to $70 per year per that single family residence is the increased cost in the millage to provide the roads and maintenance services, about $70 a year. It'll vary but I'm gonna cover that with you as well. Separate from that, stormwater services are a fee and not a tax. It's still money out of your pocket. I get that, but it, it's an important technical difference. The way it's charged right now is any single family residence in DeKalb County and the city of Tucker right now pays $4 a month towards stormwater services. And right now DeKalb gets that money. They've been charging $4 a month or $48 a year since something like 2001 when they established the stormwater utility to begin with. It's never been increased, which of course is good for your pocket, but bad for stormwater services. Our, our proposal is that if we uh, pass this referendum, that would increase to $6 a month, which amounts to $24 a year, uh, total of $72 a year for stormwater services, a $24 increase. And so I think we're gonna see the total of that. In this uh, hypothetical average house in Tucker, $70 plus $24, it would cost you something just under $100 a month, more than it's costing you right now. Uh, excuse me, a year. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> glad you're paying attention. Um, so that's the money side. Uh, go ahead. Um, this is just to show you. So there's DeKalb County charging $48 uh, a year right now. You see some of our neighbor cities, Shambly, Brookhaven, Dunwoody, and what they're charging. Uh, th this is part of the research, and we're gonna talk about it. This is part of the research we did to determine what do we have to provide? Wh what do we have to charge to provide the level of service that our citizens want and need? Um, the Cab County's made it pretty clear in recent year or so that they're gonna raise those rates. They haven't done it yet. Uh, my own uh, 
read on it is that even if they were doing a spectacular job organizing and providing these services, there's not enough money there to get it done. Uh, there's just simply not enough to address old infrastructure and all the needs that are out there. Um, so what if my home is valued more or less than $328,000? We're gonna show you kind of how that works out. So here's 228 and 428 and 728. So the stormwater rate doesn't change according to the value of your house. It's not taxed on a millage rate. It's $72 per single family residence period. The millage rate applies to the value of your house. And so you can see um, those numbers under the little icons of the houses there are totals, but they, they represent the fact that uh, if you see up above the $728,000 house, we'd see a $155 annual increase for the roads and maintenance portion and the same increase all around for the stormwater services. Uh, it's, I just wanna add one more word about that. We, so in these flyers, in the stuff that's online and out in the lobby, there's a big blown up poster version of a tax bill. And we're gonna look at that in a minute, but it, it's a little frustrating because we can't tell you, it, it depends a lot on the value of your house as well as certain exemptions you might be eligible for. There's a homestead exemption, there's a senior exemption, things like that. So your, uh, your own uh, result in all of this will be unique to you, but these numbers that we're showing you are the, are the high end. They assume you don't have anything, I think, except for our homestead exemption. So your case is likely to be a hair less than this. We're trying to be as uh, fair as we can uh, about what the actual costs are gonna be. So why is the city of Tucker advancing the public works referendum at this time? Let me let you know that we've been talking about this for better than three years now. We, we began as we, as we experienced the frustration of not being able to get the responsive service that we might prefer from DeKalb County. We started talking about how we could do better. And we went through a lot of iterations with the county, trying to create a little more innovative way, a little closer working relationship, some things the city might be able to do to advance these projects. Uh, and we just, it, we're never able to arrive at something either politically or operationally with the county to put something in place that made it better. So we're sort of faced with this very uh, one or the other kind of option, either leave it as it is and keep working and trying to make it better or take it over ourselves. So let me say kind of philosophically, you might've heard me say this before as well. When we became a city, when we were advocating for a city, it was never, the point was never to divorce ourselves in some way from DeKalb County, right? We're always gonna be residents of DeKalb County and there are services DeKalb provides that they're likely to always provide. The water system is a good example. It's, it's unlikely that ever in my lifetime or any of you, Tucker would install its own water treatment plan and its own water system, right? So we're gonna continue to be connected to the cab in those ways. Philosophically, what we said was, there are some things we think we can do better locally as a very local government, making decisions for ourselves more effectively and, and more tailored to what our community values most. And so when we took over parks and recreation, the point was what we can do in those parks and what we can design as a park system for the city of Tucker uh, is much better done by a very local group, uh, right? Who cares more about how our parks are than the people who live right here? Planning and zoning is the same way. It used to be that zoning was done by, you know, a board of commissioners and a planning commission down in Decatur who represented 800,000 people around the county. And you were lucky to get some attention on the zoning project that was proposed down the street from you. Now that's done locally by your city council and a, a planning commission of seven of your friends and neighbors. So we've come to the point where we believe this is one of those, this roads and maintenance and this uh, stormwater service is something we can do here more effectively, more responsibly, more accountable uh, than it could be done by a bigger government that represents a much wider population. So that, that first point, I mean, I've said all that, I've only gotten to the first sentence so far. So, <laughs> so it offers more local control in that the tax dollars that you pay, whereas right now they go to the county and they're, they're in a much bigger bucket that serves the whole county. This brings those tax dollars here that we spend on our priorities, both the tax dollars from the millage rate and the fee dollars from the um, stormwater uh, fee. 
There's not any uh, requirement that we do this. This is one of the things that was optional when we became a city and we said, as we identify services that we think we can provide more effectively or more cost efficiently or some combination of those things, as we identify them, we're gonna bring them forward and ask the citizens of Tucker if this is something that you wanna do locally as opposed to leaving it where it is. This point at the bottom is a big one. Um, you might remember during the course of COVID, there was something called the CARES Act early on in COVID. It was a big federal uh, funding that was nationwide, but it filtered down to states and counties and cities. City of Tucker got about $4 million from that. And it was used mostly to help um, individuals with things like rent and utilities and so on, as well as small businesses, especially kind of survive the pandemic. After that came this, this second round, much bigger. I think it was $2 trillion that the federal government dispersed to uh, more local governments. The city of Tucker wound up with about $13.5 million from that. It's a little less restricted, but one of the specific things they called out in that, the idea was that it would help communities build out uh, infrastructure, kind of an overused word, but build out infrastructure that would help uh, resiliency, another overused word, in the event of some future natural or health or other kind of disaster. So for example, we learned broadband is a big deal. High speed internet access is a big deal in COVID and uh, true in a lot of other potential kinds of things that we might face. They wanted some of this money to be spent on something like that. But stormwater was specifically one of the other things that they um, called out that they wanted this money to be spent on sort of like trash service and other things that we take for granted when people can't get to work or society is not operating on, the, on all cylinders the way that we sort of get accustomed to, things like stormwater, which you don't normally give a thought to, become really important. And so some of this money was intended to be spent in exactly this way. And so what it does is it gives us some financial cushion as we would enter into providing stormwater services for ourselves. We would be collecting these fees to fund the ongoing operations, but this ARPA money gives us an opportunity to clear the backlog, build some infrastructure that's going to last a very, very long time, and sort of get a jump start uh, into providing this service. And importantly, those funds have to be allocated by the end of 2024 and spent by the end of 2026. And as our city manager and deputy over there have reminded me from time to time, it's surprisingly difficult to spend a lot of money. Uh, we go through these processes where we have to do studies and engineering and get bids and approve those bids and wait on the contractor to be available and actually do the thing. So it's a long lead time. And we're at a, at a moment right now where we can uh, really leverage some of these dollars. Okay, Sonny, let's carry on. Uh, I want you to know that we've done a lot of work to assess our current situation and feel confident that these amounts of money that we're talking about will fund the level of service that you expect and, and that we expect of ourselves. So we've done a lot of things like um, I mentioned, we, we talked to other cities. It's interesting, cities of Dunwoody and Brookhaven, when they became cities, you wouldn't have any reason to know or care about this if you weren't in my shoes. They passed a referendum in November and they were full service cities on January 1st of that year. So they took over all these services, including stormwater, literally at the drop of a hat. Um, and so we were curious, how did that go? How did they know how much to charge? And, and our, has their experience borne out their estimates? So we did a lot of that kind of work. The answer turns out to be, yes, it's a big job, but yes, it's certainly doable. And Tucker now has much more uh, experience under its belt, uh, organization in place that can handle this kind of thing. So we have not yet done what we would do as a kind of a first step, which is pull a camera through every stormwater pipe and facility in the city to know exactly what's in there and what condition it's in and when it might need uh, repair or replacement. But we did hire a company called Atlas Technical Consultants to do some of that for us. They inspected our dams. There, there are four important dams in Tucker. They inspected those thoroughly to give us an idea of what the needs might be there. But they also pulled some cameras through some pipes to give us an idea. We have records that say, well, there's supposed to be a 24 inch corrugated pipe down there. You guys go tell if it's, if it's really there <laughs> or if it's collapsed or something like that. And they did spot checking of catch basins, which is a very glamorous term for that thing on the side of the road where the water goes down from the gutters. So they spot checked around the city to, 
to see do we really have a pretty good grip on what's out there and what kind of condition it's in that kind of bolsters our confidence that uh, we can take this on for the kind of money that we're talking about. So we did a lot of that sort of work and we feel like we're, uh, we're understanding what's there. So here's a, just a, I think we could make it available. Yes, our city manager's nodding, yep. Uh, this goes back to some of what we saw earlier. Uh, again, a lot of work to be done. Should we pass the referendum on November 8th to sort of put in place all of what's needed to begin providing these services by July 1 of next year? Okay, so here comes your tax statement. Love to get these. Go ahead. All right, so here's your current tax statement. And actually, I'll tell you, this is a place where one or two of these items were unfamiliar to us when we did our first meeting like this. So we did some studying and got our uh, language together to be able to explain it a little more clearly. But this is what your current tax bill looks like. And that first line, the top blue arrow, arrow says TKR tax dist. This is what DeKalb County is charging citizens of Tucker right now to provide the roads and maintenance portion of uh, what we're calling public works. So what that says is, it's just a hair under one mil that DeKalb County is charging right now to provide these services. Now, we don't know because DeKalb County doesn't have the records that say explicitly, in theory, they should be collecting that and at least in, at some level, spending that money back in Tucker in our footprint. But in reality, they charge this kind of thing to people all over the county. They, they run one big department, they address needs as they come up. So we don't know whether that money's really being, whether we could account for that money and say, yep, they spent exactly whatever millions of dollars it is uh, in, in the city of Tucker. But that's the way they charge it right now. Then the next two arrows uh, says city taxes. That's Tucker city taxes. That's our current millage rate that we charge. That's what uh, we fund our parks with. So when we took over parks from DeKalb County, they were charging a millage rate for parks and recreation countywide. Uh, when we took over parks, they stopped charging that rate themselves and instead put it in this city taxes line. So they, it's on your tax bill, they collect it, but they remit that to us. And I'll point out to you that, man, I'm gonna have to get my glasses. That's 0.84 some mills. That's what that number represents. So a little bit under one mil. When we took it over, it was nine tenths of one mil. We actually rolled that tax back. The city of Tucker reduced its tax rate on this item in the current budget. Uh, as we've gotten a grip on what our parks cost, gotten better at managing them, gotten better contracts to, to support them, we were able to roll that back just a little bit. And then the third one is stormwater. And you see one unit, $4 a month, $48 a year. That's what your current tax bill will look like. So what you wanna know is what's my tax bill gonna look like if this passes? What's gonna be the difference? So we're, we're gonna show you that. And this, this is what's on those boards uh, out front. So the top line, Tucker Tax District goes away. That's not a, a county tax anymore. It goes to zero. The city taxes rate would increase so we would have what we had before, we would have what the county's presently charging, and we're proposing a small increase in that. So I can't, I honestly can't read. 2.3 some odd mills total to fund parks and recreation and roads and maintenance. And this is the line that for the average house would amount to about a $70 increase. If you follow me, all that put together, we have one millage rate for the city, that covers those items. And then we have storm water, water that instead of being uh, $4 a month and $48 a year is $6 a month, $72 a year. And so this is what your tax bill would look like and while, how all that flows through and, and what the difference would be to you. So here they are side by side. This is what's on the posters out front, right? So you can get up close without your glasses and <laughs> see what I've just explained, but it's a side by side. This one goes to zero. That one goes to 2.3 mils. That one goes from 48 to $72. That's what you'd be looking for. And that's what you would see on your future tax bills uh, as we go through this. I'll, I'll, um, I'll save that. I wanted to point out one other thing, but I think it'll be better in a minute. 
Uh, so here's the other half of the question. We've been talking about what if this passes? What if it doesn't pass? Well, everything stays the same. Cab County continues to provide both of these services at the rates that they charge. Your tax bill doesn't change. Uh, as we uh, hear from you about issues where you live or work, uh, we will continue to report them to the cab and have these monthly meetings to go through them with their folks and, and hope that we can find a way to improve responsiveness. But basically, a no vote says, nope, leave everything just like it is. Uh, we're good to go. And we would stop working and thinking about it altogether. Pretty much that simple. Here's the key dates again about voting. Um, I think you probably got that by now. Uh, and Sonia mentioned this at the beginning, but uh, we have on our website, so tuckerga.gov is kind of your source for everything that's going on in the city, projects we're working on, things that are before the city council, so on. We put up a special page, tuckerga.gov slash public works, where you'll find all this information. Of course, you can follow us on social media and all those places, city of Tucker government, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, oh, we have rules for question and answer. <laughs> Just please keep it relevant. Uh, you can stand up and ask your question. We mentioned uh, not only can the folks online not hear you unless you're at the microphone, but our recording won't hear your question uh, unless you're using the microphone. So if you'd rather not do that, we'll get you a comment card or I'll try to uh, repeat it for everybody's benefit. Uh, and then afterwards, if you think of something, there are some places you can send your question or look for um, additional answers and things. Yeah. So that's kind of it for what we wanted to present. Um, there's some other things I might want to add, but let's let's hear from you guys what's most important pressing on your mind. Come right up. It's on just. It's weird to have my back to everybody. All right. Well, you know, what? we could turn that around. There you go. Just look at that. Right. Hello. Um, I'm Claire Hayes. I live on Oakcrest Drive. Um, I have one question that came to my mind in my own little brain and one to present from a neighbor who can't be here. Right. Um, we've already paid our county taxes. So the money we've paid is already allocated, budgeted by the county to be spent between now and June 30th. Is that Roughly right. Yeah, and it's a little above my pay grade to give you the exact dates, but that's the reason for this long transition period because they have to, if we pass this referendum, they have to make these changes in the tax bills that would go out next, next year. year, just following. So if you start providing services July 1st, you do that with what money? If the county is keeping what we just paid? Yep. Well, there's a couple of parts to that. So we would begin collecting those fees right away on July 1st. There's a, there's a kind of a reconciliation that has to take place between us and the county about mm -hmm. not only money they've already collected, but needs and jobs that have already been reported that we consider them responsible for. So there'd be some negotiation okay. in there to say, you, you don't get off the hook. You promised to do this. Yeah, and it already okay. exists, right? Yeah. It, it's not okay. something that happened since we took over the service. Yeah. And then from a neighbor, she said, well, governments always just want to come back and ask for more money. And uh, what if there's like a big flood? And can this amount of new money cover a disaster? Yep. Or will the city just come back and ask for more money to do that? Yep. Uh, so in fairness, I'll, uh, several things. First of all, it's painful for me to introduce myself and say, I'm Frank Om and I'm with the government because I'm, <laughs> I'm the same way. <laughs> but that's why, so it was very intentional when we became a city that we said, because this question came up a lot, oh, it's got another layer of government, it's gonna be double taxation, all these things. And we said, okay, just to make absolutely sure that that's not the case, we're gonna limit ourselves to one mill of, of capacity to tax. The city of Tucker can never charge more than one mill, including that 0.9 mills that we did for parks when we first took those over, unless there's a referendum. That's why we're in this process. So this is not the government saying, we're raising your taxes. This is the government saying, would you be willing to pay more taxes for this level of service, for what we believe we can provide? And so that's why the question that's on there is a little bit convoluted because it talks about, shall we take over these services, but also raise taxes enough to pay for them? 
So we have to actually raise our own millage rate just to make room for the taxes that we would take from DeKalb that we're already paying. So all of that plus the, the American Rescue Plan money I mentioned gives us some real cushion. That's one of our first concerns. What if something happens on July the 2nd, we get a big flood, all the stormwater runs over, there's problems, where's the money gonna come from? Uh, we will have that money available should, should the worst happen uh, early on in the, in the process. And one other thing I'll mention that wasn't in the, in the uh, 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 presentation, there will likely be an escalator in the cost of, we had this question last time, what if you do the same thing the cab did, set a rate and leave it alone for 20 years while inflation does what it does, so there's something called the municipal cost index. I think that's the right name of it. It's kind of a third party that does something like they, they measure the consumer price index. It's a, it's a number that's arrived at that says cost of providing municipal services went up 1.4% this year. So that stormwater rate would likely include a, an annual escalator. So it would immediately become $6.12 or whatever it is uh, instead in order to keep up with rising costs over time. Okay, and just my last comment is that I told this neighbor that when I vote on anything, people or taxes or whatever, that I base it on my experience and my expectations. And my experience has been very good with the city and my expectations are high. Yes. So <laughs> you. you guys need to pull up yeah. your socks and you know this needs to be yeah. really good, but I, I honestly expect that it will be. Thank you. Well, it's serious work. We, we, we take it very seriously and it's, it's it's core services of a city. Really at bottom, cities and counties, uh, city and county governments are service delivery mechanisms, right? We're not legislatures. We don't typically take up all kinds of other issues. We make sure the roads are safe. We make sure the parks are good and safe. We do building inspections so that when you walk into a building, you're not afraid the roof is going to collapse. That's what cities do. And this is right in line with that. I'm not the expert. Your council uh, has never... I can speak for all of us and say none of us has ever been in any other office where this kind of thing took place, but we have some fantastic uh, city management people, long-term professionals who have done this before, who understand what it's like to start up such a service from the ground. And um, we're, we're confident in them and we're excited to take on the, the challenge of it. And we think we have all the resources we need. That's why now is kind of the moment to, to get this done. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, my name is Sharon Summers Cryer. I live at uh, 4484 Sims Court. I've been there for 31 years. When the city started, I was on the tree ordinance to try to uh, build a tree ordinance and stop stormwater drainage and stuff like that. Um, I'm now a claims adjuster for federated insurance and I do commercial claims for excavation claims and pipes and stuff like that. So I have very good knowledge of what is underground. And the reality is none of us really knows. The pipes have been put in there for the last 30, 40 years made out of different materials. They cannot be located by the, more, the majority of locate services. The joke amongst contractors is the way to find the pipes is to hit them with the back, back of a backhoe. That's really how they find most of the pipes. So my concern is you were talking about uh, the water system and I came to the last meeting and I had a lot of concerns about what was going on then and I mentioned those. And I went home and thought about a lot of the problems and how to possibly um, solve them, which is why I'm back to offer a suggestion mm -hmm. um, because the water system and the stormwater systems run parallel. And there's a very high likelihood that when we go to find problems, we will be adjacent to water problems and it won't be our part to do the water. It'll be our part to fix the, the stormwater and not the water, but we're likely to find problems in both. And there was a mentioning of a million dollars to be spent on a study to find out how bad the problem was. And the reality is the study's not going to really buy that much for us because there's, we have to dig to find out what the problems are. So I think that the million dollar study should not be done. And we also talked about 
how we have some problems with our relationship with the county. And the reality is if you don't have something to bring to the table, you have no negotiating power with the county. So my suggestion is to not have this study and this millage rate, but cut the millage rate in half and then go to the county with that money and say, instead of the study for a million dollars, we'll give you a million dollars to upgrade your equipment. Reality wise, a million dollars will buy maybe three or four pieces of equipment or repair about 10. That's how much equipment costs now. And so, because I pay for those things too in my claims. And so the reality is if we go to the county with money and say, here's a million dollars to fix your facilities, to fix your, your equipment, come back to us. Here's our top 10 list. We're going to give you the rest of this money to do our top 10 list. And if you do a good job at this, we'll bring you back some more money and we'll vote to do this again. And then we build a relationship with the county and we build back the infrastructure and we do it jointly. And then we offer a leadership role in the county and maybe the other cities will join in and maybe Avondale Estates and Clarkston will say, hey, that's working pretty well for Tucker. I'd like to do that too. And our, our people want to do that. And we want to build the relationship with the county and negotiate and get the services that we deserve and the money's earmarked for Tucker. And we have a list and we show up and they have to show what they've done. I think that would be a better way to spend our money than what is being proposed at this moment. Mm -hmm. And I really think that we could have a better relationship with the county if we had money to bring to the negotiation table. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Mary Anderson. I live on Arl Down Drive. Um, I'm sort of piggybacking off the last lady, but um, my neighbor and I have a culvert in between us, and um, it had failed, basically. It has uh, dropped about eight inches, six or eight inches, and has started pulling the, the yard down with it. We had to put cones where the holes are opening up over the top of the culvert. And so we called Tucker and Tucker um, sent it to DeKalb County. And it took a while for, it, for them to respond, but they finally came out and looked at it. And um, the response was, well, you're, you're welcome to fix it yourself. Mm. But there was no uh, indication at all of fix it to what standard or how to fix it or what is required to fix it. And my question is, if, you know, if this takes over, I mean, I would love to, to think that Tucker would fix it, but if they didn't, would we be working with the zoning and planning? Like what, what, would, what would we need to do to find out, fix it to whose standards, what size? I mean, it's like you can yeah. bend over and walk in this, in this thing. Yeah, so. there's big pipes. Yeah. And when they collapse, they leave a big hole. Yeah. Yep. Um, well. I'll answer in a couple of parts. So there would be a document. I don't know what I can provide you. Yeah, it's called Extent of Service that sort of defines all that. Okay. And honestly, it gets a little complicated, partly because so much of this has been around for a long time. Kind of where does the city or county's responsibility start and stop? And, and what what is your responsibility? So it's very individualized. Is there an easement on your property? Is there something recorded with the deed that says this is you and that's the county? Yeah. Uh, but those same kinds of things would translate to the city. And so yeah. there would be an objective source that says, look, we're, we're responsible from the street to what's called the head wall, maybe the, the, the concrete where the conduit comes out into a ditch or runs under your property. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty well defined. And we would be able to tell you that some of the advice we got, as a matter of fact, the county's not been good you know they send a crew out at some point when you've reported a problem like that but they're not always clear with the homeowner like here's here's our part of this and yeah, we got none of that yeah in the county. None. that's an area where we think we can do a lot better at least in the beginning we see the problem and we say look this is 
what we are responsible for we're going to fix if there's something else that's elsewhere or farther down in your property you'll at least know in the beginning that's yours anyway you can start working on it now or with us or whatever the case would be but yeah there's a pretty hefty document that <laughs> defines that kind of stuff you know when you're when you're looking to buy into the neighborhood you don't think Oh, is that mine? Is that my neighbor's? Yeah. We just figured out oh, that's the county section, mm -hmm. like a little easement or something, but we didn't drill down into the yeah. paperwork. And most people don't think about it till something until happens, too late. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Have you got the cards if somebody wants to be scribbling out a question for you? Hi, uh, my name is Larry Gentry. I live on Rotherwood Drive. Um, and uh, I'd like to, I think I read somewhere that the city was actually anticipating doing this in 2020 before the pandemic started. Before, and before we, we had talked to, about it that yeah, yeah. far. And to the point of maybe even putting a referendum out that year. Mm -hmm. So I'd give kudos to the city's, the city's leaders for, for having this on the, the, the front burner for more than just the, the last year or so. And I think one of the things that I haven't heard about is, uh, and I'm hoping that the city will, in, in time to come, be uh, responsive to is uh, stormwater uh, uh, storage. And I live uh, uh, on Lake Ivanhoe, and uh, we've been storing stormwater for 50 years with no help whatsoever from the county. And of course, along with that stormwater comes a lot of sedimentation. And uh, we've got I have got pictures of where a culvert comes under Rotherwood, the street that I live on, directly into our lake. And it's just now, there's no water at the end of that culvert. Now it's just all filled with dirt. Mm. And um, so the, and speaking, to, I wanted to speak also really quickly to what the, the, the lady said earlier about trying to continue to negotiate with the county. I think the county has proven in the way they've dealt with our negotiations over the three, the three lakes thing, They've been promising us for six years to do that, and they're not doing it. That's typically the way they do things. I don't care how much money we take to the table. Uh, the county on only responds when it's an emergency or when they absolutely have to with a club over their head. All right. Well, thanks. Steve. Um, it's, I have a math question I mean, and it's, it's not a huge difference, but the example that you use on this side shows a $90 increase and that's supposed to be on $131,000 appraised value. Maybe, uh, but then when you, value? well, no, it, it says assessed and you're using assessed value here, but then when you flip, when you look at the pictures of these little homes, you start off with 228,000 and it's a $73 increase versus a 90. No, so that's a, that's a total, it's possible that we got some of our terminology confused in there, but so the tax, the, y'all probably know, they assess the value of your house, which you may or may not <laughs> agree with. And then they take 40% of that as the amount on which you're taxed sort of reduces the margin of error. And so there's, yeah, there's assessed value and taxable value and so on. And it, I haven't seen what you're pointing out, but it's possible that there are different examples and maybe we used the wrong term somewhere. Well, yeah, the column on, on these, the columns here says, it says um, taxable assessment. Yeah, well, we'll give it a look. So now these that were in the presentation and I think are the same as there, these are, these are totals. So that $228,000 house has in it $24 increase for that's related to stormwater. So the 73 represents the, whatever that is, $59. Did I do that right? Of increase in property tax based on the millage rate plus 24 for the difference in um, the stormwater fee. Okay, so yeah, like I say, it's a small small difference, but you're going from 131 to two, you know, to 228. It's just a little confusing. And all the what I've read so far and seen is that you're always talking about homes, 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 but the commercial properties are going to be taxed as well. 
what is, um, I mean, what is the roughly the the taxable value of homes in the city versus commercial properties, and what does this mean to a commercial property owner? Yeah, so it is a good question. So businesses or commercial properties are taxed on something called an ERU, an equivalent residential unit. So I mentioned that every single family home, I already said taxed, they they're feed tomato tomato. Every res single family residential pays the same rate. A commercial business is assessed an ERU, which the idea is that's uh, equivalent to one residential property. And what happens is it, they are evaluated based on how much impermeable surface they have. So you take a something like the new public shopping center that has lots and lots of pavement, asphalt that, for parking and that sort of thing. They pay so many they're they're defined as so many ERUs. So I have no idea, but let's pick a number. If they're a hundred, the equivalent of a hundred single family homes, they would pay 100 times that 48 or $72 a year. So the, 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 proportionally it's the same effect for them as for homes, but it's a function of how much impermeable surface their buildings and their parking and other things cover. So uh, does the city have any numbers on you know what? Uh, let's say the new public's um, uh, facility would be paying. Yeah, I don't Additional know that offhand. We did we did a bunch of sampling of different sizes and shapes of commercial properties. Um, I'll I'll say it this way, at risk of seeming cavalier about it: six dollars instead of four is a fifty percent increase, but it's a small number in the scheme of things for them. So if they're paying. $7,500 a year right now in stormwater fees, they'd be paying 50% more than that. And so it might be three, $4,000 more than they're paying now over the course of a year. I mean, I like Tucker, as a resident, I like Tucker because the fees of the businesses pay what, 80% yeah. of our budget? That's why we care Something an like awful that. lot about our businesses, yeah. keeping them and attracting new ones. Yeah, they pay the freight. So um, my final question is, why is the city, you know, coming to the, um, the community and asking for taxes, be they small, tax increase, when for seven years you have not wanted to have any public discussion on impact fees on residential developers that add population to our city? The city, in my estimation, and I've done the math, is losing about a million dollars a year, which could go to our parks. And indeed, the money that we've seen going into our parks is mostly coming from um, the sales tax, property which tax. will expire. Property tax. No, it's coming from our special purpose... I'm talking about money that's currently going into our parks is coming from the special purpose sales tax. Proper, no, no, it's lost, uh, and we can- Spot, we've, we've, we've $400,000. Spots can only be used on capital improvements. So it's not going into our parks. And we've tried to talk about no, this. It's true with impact mayor, fees as well. Mayor, yes, the property taxes that are collected runs our parks, that's for operation. But the $400,000, the $450,000 that is going into improving our parks, folks, uh, parks, ladies and gentlemen, is coming from SPLOS. And that will expire in March of 24. The city, if that doesn't, if that sales tax is not increased or renewed, the city will have zero money, essentially zero money for park improvements and the path. And so my point is, but it's exactly it's all case, in the budget. It's exactly the case that we're in now. We have priorities that we want to fund. We have to find sources for that funding. If SPLOS, I'm 1,000% certain that SPLOS will be renewed because we've done a good job with it. But if it weren't, we would have to look around and say, well, if we still have priorities to spend that much money, we have to raise it somewhere else. And so people would save a penny on sales tax. Maybe we'd have to raise the property tax. Whatever the case is, but impact fees, uh, 
slice and dice it any way you want. We've talked and we have heard from you endlessly about impact fees, and we've decided they're a bad idea for a lot of good reasons, and they're certainly mayor, not as mayor, simple as just you saying, have talked. You have talked amongst yourselves. You have talks amongst yourselves. About I'm, I'm very sorry, but we need to stay on topic of public works. Thank you very much. About, Thank you very much, Steve. About adding two new services to the city. The mayor and the council does not want to talk about how to raise a million dollars a year. Because the real people want to Steve, you're, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, there are like eight or 10 different Facebook pages that Steve has established to try to get this underway. So knock yourself out. Well, sorry about that, y'all. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Andy Rogers. I live up on Bonaparte Drive, and I'm just curious. And I, I okay, sorry. And I think you said that we have no idea what the condition of the uh, sewer systems is now. Do we know what you're inheriting, or are we just taking that and it's going to be a shot in the dark? Yeah. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, I don't know if you can get back to where we were, but. It, it, first of all, it's not the sewer system. I want to be real clear because well, people, this yeah, drainage. right. Correct. Uh, we do have a lot of idea of what's down there. As somebody else mentioned, you don't know till you dig. We will know, and there was also a mention of a million dollar study, which was just kind of a and are they very round ballpark on, on scoping everyone. Yeah, that's systems. what that would be that that we think might cost as much as a million dollars to just see what we've got. Yeah, and once and when we. When we have that, um, there's a lot of benefits to that. It doesn't exist now, right? So the cab has these records that date back decades that we think there's a corrugated pipe <laughs> runs from here to there. We first need to know that it's there and then what the condition of it is inside. But once we have that, our GIS uh, department, somebody introduced our, our manager of that department, all that'll be then saved sort of forever. So we'll know what's there, but when we fix it, we'll also know when it was fixed and in what way and what we replaced it with or whatever the case may be. Before we take it over, are we gonna have, will there be any, is that gonna be part of the negotiations with DeKalb County? Because can we say, you get this and we get this? Uh, I mean, I don't well, know how it works. I don't think quite the way you're asking, but things that are known that we've reported that we, we will expect them to follow through on that. Yeah. So. I don't want to sound like we don't know because we we've done a lot of work to know, but you don't really know <laughs> until you get there. And that's sort of a generic question. I agree. Yeah, and the reason for for doing that first is it'll help us set our priorities, Absolutely. right? Rather than waiting for something to break, we will know we got to get to that pronto because it's going to collapse and or break. Get or, to Cab County to help fund it, or in your taking over in a, a, in a, a number. <laughs> in the most optimistic view, yes. But the 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 rate that we're charging. And this is why it's important. Uh, I mentioned like Dunwoody and, and uh, Brookhaven. When they became cities, they had nothing. Uh, the, right. All they knew or thought they knew was whatever DeKalb had. So we wanted to know, well, when you decided to charge $6 or whatever different ones are charging, how has that worked out? Now, when you talk to those other cities, what was their answer? To, were they? It's, they're, they're pleased. That, that's where we get Turned them. out well. That's where we had the most encouragement is from kind of our neighbor cities saying, Oh my gosh, <laughs> and you really yeah. should do this. Okay, and I was just curious about that because because my experience with uh, Decatur, they don't even know where their their storm yeah. drainage is, let alone what they've got. Anyways, that's they're a little story. bit of a special case. That's another story. Um, what what are you anticipating in building your staff? How how big a an operation is this going to be? As well as now, are we going to have to buy all the equipment to redo the roads, redo the curbs, redo the yeah. Or are we going to get some of the equipment from the county? Yeah, well, it's a no great question. Just Thanks. Curious. Yeah. So there's, there's different models, kind of the two ends of the spectrum are we would hire everybody ourselves, employ them in the city, buy all the equipment, you know, full on investment like that. The far end of the other, the far other end of the spectrum is that we contract everything to everybody and we call on them as, you know, to meet our priorities or respond to emergencies, whatever the case might be. 
that's part of what we're examining now. We've talked to several different firms uh, that can provide those kind of services. I may be speaking out of turn. I'm looking at my <laughs> city manager over there because she gets to decide most of this, but it'll likely be a, a management uh, staff employed by the city. Like we have a city engineer now, I have a department like that, uh, who will oversee contracts. Like we'll have an asphalt contractor, right? They don't just to get way down to the nuts and bolts. They don't typically bring an asphalt truck to fill one pothole on your street. Maybe we accumulate them for a week and that contractor comes and fills all the potholes that we've come up with for that week. Likewise, they're on duty. If there's an emergency and we need them, they, our contract would say we, we have to have response within a very short period of time. And so generally it would be a kind of a, a level system, say one through four. And we would say everything that falls in level one gets response in 24 hours. Everything in, in level two that can wait a bit, maybe within one week and so on down the line. And we would have a contractor who cuts down trees, a contractor who mows the right of ways, a contractor who, whatever, spreads salt when there's a winter storm coming. We would manage those contracts much like DeKalb and every other city does. Uh, it typically doesn't make much sense for a, a city of our scale to try to own and employ all those people. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, certainly. It's Roger Orlando, one of our city council members from District 1. Uh, council member Reese and I are about to leave. It's not because we don't have absolute enthusiasm about uh, this uh, process, process and, and this vote on November 8, but because she took a terrible fall and had surgery recently, is in a lot of pain, and I'm her transportation. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank Thanks, you, for letting us know. Thanks for being here, Virginia. I'm Bruce Nutter. I live at Duesenberg Drive. Um, I've been curious about this. I mean, Public Works is has a lot of moving parts, as we've been hearing. And uh, it seems like if it comes down to where difficult decisions need to be made or, or contracts need to be managed or vetted or whatever, the city has uh, some commissions and boards, you know, the, like uh, the Planning Commission, a Public Facilities Commission, things like that. Will there be a public works commission formed with people, um, you know, maybe residents who vote and maybe also some representatives from the CIDs since we're creating a taxing authority and using people's money? Yeah, it's uh, a good question. I'm not sure that we've considered it. We have, uh, in fact, I got a similar sort of a question yesterday. Like, why haven't you, why haven't you uh, appointed a, a study commission or a, a, a citizen's advisory board about public works? Well, I'd answer two things, not to be flipped because your suggestion may be a good one. First of all, your city council is a citizen advisory board. You, you elected those folks and me and the others. That's what we do. The other part of that is this entire proposal is a citizen's advisory board, right? That's why it is the way that it is your city council is not gonna show up here one night and vote to increase your taxes and let you know later, this whole process is defined in our charter so that we have to give you all the information and you get to decide if you wanna, if you believe raising your own taxes to provide this level of service is a good idea, that's what it's about. But as an ongoing thing uh, to advise about how the, the service is being delivered and handled and whether we ought to change something about the definitions, not a bad thought, thanks. Who else? Been here a while, people are getting antsy. I'll stay as long as you like. Well, we'll, we'll um, stay here and uh, our staff who's on hand can help answer some of your questions. You can pick up some of this literature over here that has a lot of the information, including the uh, places you can go find more and more detail. And if you think of something after you're gone, uh, let us know and we will answer your question and update it for everybody else's benefit. Uh, immediately. One more thought. Uh, um, still Larry Gentry, Rotherwood Drive. Um, I'm curious about the, the million dollar storm water study. 
will will part of that study also include um, uh, the basins that the uh, stormwater yeah uh, storm st stormwater serves where we live. We have stormwater coming into our pond off of Old Knock Cross Road, Shambly Tucker Road, and Smithsonian. Uh, we are, man, we are uh, receiving, I'm sure, millions of gallons of stormwater a year mm -hmm. from the roads. Will part of that study look at uh, drainage basins and how uh, how that's not been managed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's the entire system. And I don't want to get too hung up on it, it, the million dollar study. We don't know yet if that's what it would cost. It'd be in that range, but the point of it would be no, no assumptions, no, well, we saw it here, so we assume it's there. This is actually eyeballing an inside and out pipes as well as ditches, head walls, what runs under the streets and where it ends up in, retention, detention facilities and so forth. That's why I mentioned the dams. So like uh, um, Lake Aaron at Henderson Park, Kofer Lake at Kofer Park, those are stormwater detention facilities. I'm gonna tell you, I gotta do some work on, on what's happening up at your lake because I've been hearing about it as long as I've been mayor. There's some sort of is and sort of isn't part of the stormwater system officially. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave it there, but there's been a lot of dispute and confusion with you guys and yeah but it's serving the purpose one way or another yeah yeah all right i'm gonna call us call us done there but please stay around and ask your questions if there's anything else we can answer for you we're happy to do it appreciate y'all being here and please help spread the word voting is underway right now